You're listening to a podcast of Relatively Speaking on MPB Think Radio. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. Good morning and thanks for listening. This is Relatively Speaking, the show all about you and your family. And I'm Dr. Susan Buttress, Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. So today we're talking about infant mental health. Did you know that many mental health and interpersonal challenges have their roots in infancy? It's real. It's really true. And if those issues are addressed early, mental health disorders may be preventable. Interesting. I bet it's knowledge that you really didn't have. It's, it's actually information that is not that new. But today we have Dr. Courtney Walker, psychologist, professor, um, assistant professor of pediatrics and infant mental health expert with us to explore more about the roots of mental health. So before we get to Dr. Walker, I just want to introduce a couple of thoughts and And uh, listeners, I want you to come up with questions that you might have about perhaps your history, perhaps your child or your grandchild, and maybe what's going on with them as we talk about this. I want you to understand how important this topic really is. I think a lot of people may think, oh, golly, infant mental health, get, get real. That can't be so. But it can be, and it is real. When we talk about mental health, we often focus on teens and and certainly a lot in adults. But we rarely consider the mental health of infants in the very young child. Because how could that be? How could it even happen, right, that that little ones who have such uncomplicated lives um, – could be upset about anything. How could they even have mental health issues? Well, sadly, many mental health concerns really can have roots that are traceable to early, very, very early challenges occurring in infancy and early childhood. We also know that early interventions for the developing minds are necessary to prevent future mental health disorders. Now, you've heard me say that about preventing other disabilities. Say, early on, a child has speech-language problems. Well, if you intervene early and work with that child, then they do better. If you have a child with, say, temper tantrums even, if you intervene early with working with that child in the temper tantrums, then they learn how to manage that. Um, If a child has handwriting issues or fine motor issues, we intervene early. But what we're talking about now is intervening early on any kind of mental health or um, behavioral health issues. So there's really clear evidence that indicates, we know this already, that brain growth um, in the very young child, in the infant, is rapid, rapid, and the most important time, that birth to three period, okay? We also know that attachment relationships, and we'll talk with Dr. Walker more about that as we move along, are really, really important in in infancy and crucial to healthy development. And we're talking not just mental health development, but overall development. So if someone has a secure attachment and has secure emotional support, an infant, then they're going to manage things better. That's something I want us to talk about as we move along. So if early relationships are highly stressful um, through perhaps absence, through a depressed parent, through um, violence in the home, then the pathways, those neuronal pathways, so those connections that are happening very rapidly, over a million a second of those connections are happening and laying down pathways in those very young children. If those are disrupted, through stressful situations, then perhaps we're disrupting 
other issues that are going along, okay? So those early challenges may cause some pretty significant later uh, mental health and interpersonal relationship issues um, that we could prevent. So today I want you to learn about what we all can do. And even if you're not a parent, if you're a grandparent, if you're if you are a caregiver of any sort, if you are an aunt or an uncle or a sibling who perhaps has much younger siblings, this is all for you. So I am so excited to have Dr. Walker here because Dr. Walker is one of those psychologists who's on the cutting edge of this um, infant mental health topic that we want to talk about. So um, welcome, Dr. Walker, Courtney Walker. Hi, thanks for having me. Well, I'm so glad you're here. Um, and I'm excited about having you talk with us a little bit. Um, I'm going to throw out the phone number, and then I have a few questions for you myself. So listeners, you can call in at any time with your thoughts or your questions at one eight seven seven mpb ring That's 877-672-7464. Or you can send an email to family at mpbonline.org. Um, Think about it, listeners, as we're going along. Do you have a situation right now where you might be concerned about an infant's mental health or a young child's mental health? So so while I threw that word out there, Dr. Walker, why don't you just give us a good, solid definition of what what we are talking about when we are talking about infant mental health, if you will, please? Sure. Um, so I know many of our listeners may be balking at the idea of infant mental health or even that that descriptor. At least, you know, that was my reaction when I first heard it. Like, what do you mean infant mental health? That doesn't make any sense. So another word that we use to describe it is we uh, refer to it as early relational health. And that seems to make a little bit more sense to people. But generally, infant mental health is synonymous with healthy social and emotional um, development. So it, it really encompasses an um, infant or toddler's ability to develop um, the capacity to experience, manage, or regulate um, and express their emotions form close and secure interpersonal relationships, and we'll kind of talk about um, how that relates to attachment. Yeah, I think that um, attachment is one of those issues that I think we know can can be um, impaired by many things. Uh, like I said, neglect or um, uh, perhaps a parent who is depressed. And so um, that's a topic. As we move along, I want us to make sure that we touch on the issue of maternal depression and why it's so important to look at that too. Yeah, obviously, maternal and paternal um, mental health is so interrelated into infant mental health. And really, it's hard to talk about infant mental health or early relational health without talking about the parents um, and the well-being of the parents, because that is really where infants and young children learn all of these things. Um, so parents are really setting the foundation for their infant's mental health or early relational health. Yeah, and that's a lot of pressure on parents, I think. Yeah. But uh, it's something that um, I want to, and I'm so glad you said maternal and paternal, so both mother and father. And we know that that if a father is depressed, it can certainly affect the function of the family and the function of the infant too. And so that's, as we are talking through this, I want, I know we're getting ready 
to put a lot of pressure on what goes on in the home as to how that individual becomes a successful adult. But I also want us to remind ourselves that we also need to know that if there is someone, a parent, a young parent, who is in the home, or an older parent, who is in the home and struggling with um, perhaps mental health issues themselves, the best we can do is to try to figure out how to get them help. So um, let's go to our first break. And um, when we come back, I want to talk um, more about the vulnerability of, of that infant brain and why we're talking about this topic and perhaps what a parent can do to try to help. Um, jump in the conversation. Give us a call at one eight seven seven mpb ring That's one 672 7464 If you have a question or if you have a case that you want to discuss, a, perhaps a situation maybe in your own home or someone else's. Give us a call. Let us discuss it. This is Relatively Speaking. We're talking about infant mental emotional health. We'll be right back. The entire foundation of your child's brain is being built in the first five years of life. This construction is strengthened through the child's interactions with others. Hi, I'm Dr. Susan Buttress. The good news is you have what it takes to be a brain builder. Learn more at MississippiThrive.com. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Well, welcome back and thanks for listening. This is Relatively Speaking, and today we're talking about infant mental health or infant relational health. And we have Dr. Courtney Walker with us, psychologist from UMC. Um, an expert in early infant mental and behavioral health. Um, so as we were talking during the break, um, Dr. Walker, our wonderful producer, Michelle McAdoo, has a question for you that I think might be a question many listeners are wondering about. Uh, my question is, if a child is nine or even six or 12, and they're having behavioral problems, uh, acting out, being defiant, hitting walls, and those type of behaviors. Is that a true mental health issue? Having lack of structure for very young children perhaps brings out more behavioral issues later on in as children get older. So, Dr. Walker, you want to comment on that? Yeah, well, it's a it's a great question, and I'm sure it's a lot of uh, a lot of listeners are um, maybe grappling with that with their own child or a child in their life, and it's it's really hard to say. Um, so sometimes, so kids, especially young kids, communicate through behaviors. Most of us do, but really, kids do, um, and it. Having behavioral issues can signal a whole lot of different things. Sometimes it can signal, hey, I'm having some mental health struggles and I need help. Sometimes it signals, hey, um, my home environment um, isn't really the best and I'm having some trouble dealing with that like any other person would. And so whenever we have a kid who's having behavioral issues, we try to take a very holistic view of what could be underlying that. Is there a mental health problem? Is there an environmental problem? Or is there a combination of both? And we try to interpret what those mean. Um, And, you know, it could be different for every kid, but it's, it, it really requires a really holistic view and assessment of those behaviors and what they're really trying to tell us. 
Right. You know, I think you mentioned something that I, I want us to take off on a little bit, and, and that is how infants communicate. So they don't have words. Young children, you know, if you have if you have a very young infant as they're learning how to even make co- eye contact and then smile and coo and jabber, um, a lot of times they communicate to us in ways that sometimes we miss, um, like crying. You know, a lot of times I'll I'll tell you when I had my first child many years ago, she's over 40 now. Um I was told to just let her cry it out when she was a very young infant. Um she ha- she was a little colicky. She had a little bit of difficulty um self-settling and self-soothing. And and I was told to just quit picking her up. Well, something we know now, maybe that wasn't the best advice in the world. Um, So I want us to talk about how babies communicate. They cry. They may hiccup. They may, they may turn their gaze away from you if, if they feel overstimulated, or they may put their gaze towards you. They may look at you like pleadingly to do something, but um, that's the way they communicate even before they can extend their hand out and reach, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And especially um, young babies, we're talking infants. Right. So they really start to develop this capacity really around eight weeks. And I know that's really early, but, you know, babies come out prepared and wired to learn and they learn through their relationships with their caregivers. So it's it's actually really powerful. Um, but, you know, babies, like you said, have an array of, of ways that they communicate to us. And usually what we see is that a lot of that, um, especially very early on, is directed towards that primary caregiver. So, and I want to I want to kind of go back on what I said earlier because I know we had a focus on moms and dads, but I also want the listeners to know that other people can be a primary attachment figure for babies. It might be grandma, it might be aunt, it might be uncle, whoever is that consistent caring person in their life has that ability to really impart those healthy relationships and a model for a healthy relationship. You know, that's where kind of the village or the saying comes um, from, you know, it takes a village. It really does take a village to, to raise a healthy baby and a healthy child. Um, but anyway, so a lot of those behaviors are directed towards that primary attachment figure, that primary caregiver. And so, you know, you can see babies um, get a little unsettled once if they if a new person is in front of them and they're like I don't I don't understand who this is and I'm going to look to my caregiver and say hey is is this okay is this person okay because that's their a secure base for exploring the world and learning about other people other things what's good what's not um, and so um, they usually direct a lot of those things towards their primary caregiver or caregivers Mom or dad. So, Dr. Walker, as I was preparing for this show, I ran across something I've, I've often seen in my practice, and it's where you, parents feel like they are are doing all the right stuff, um, but there seem to be almost a personality or emotional mismatch between the parent and and the child, or the parents and the child. So, for example, you might have a child who is much, much quieter than gregarious parents who are outgoing, yeah. or or the opposite. Do you mm-hmm. think that that is something that is, and I'll have my own comments later, but do you think that is something that is innate, inborn? Is that something that perhaps is created? Is there something that maybe parents did differently? I know, for example, in my children, um, 
I have two daughters who are on almost, you know, personality-wise, very different. Um, one likes to be center stage. The other likes to be the the person who works in the background and takes the pictures. And so just uh, wonder about that. I know there are listeners out there who have thoughts about that. So would you comment? Yeah. Well, I don't think we're going to have a revelation here. I'm going to say <laughs> it's both. It's both. Um, I think, you know, temperament is, you know, it's related to genetics. It's related to just who people are when they come into the world. But it also is influenced and shaped and molded by experiences. But for the most part, I think um, people do have a, just a general temperament um, as an infant. And sometimes that kind of persist throughout life. And it doesn't necessarily mean that something is wrong or the parent did anything wrong. Sometimes it's just that that's who this baby is. That's who this person is. Um, but you're right. Sometimes there is a mismatch between parent kind of personality style and their child's temperament or personality. And mixed messages get sent sometimes. And it's really hard to get on the same page. And I think some parents kind of worry um, when that happens, like, oh, well, does that mean that I don't know my baby? I don't understand my baby. Am I being a bad parent? No, um, this is a relationship just like any other relationship. And sometimes it's helpful to have um, a person say, hey, I, you know, I noticed that when the baby does this, um, they're communicating that they're hungry or that they'd like more attention or that they're ha- they, they had too much attention. Right. And so that's where infant mental health specialists can come in and kind of decode some of that miscommunication between baby and the caregiver and help the caregiver understand um, the baby in a, a different light and interpret their behavior in a different way and learn about them. So certainly uh, that good information there. Um, I think what I wanted to point out, too, is often you truly can have a baby that comes out maybe a little bit emotionally wired to be a little bit more difficult. And I know, you know, often I've heard many mothers talk about this, that, golly, if my first baby had been like the second baby, I probably never would have had a second child because this child is so difficult. And, um, so I I want us to make sure as we're talking through this that we don't put all the onus, like you just said, it's both. It's not that, oh, my gosh, you just didn't manage this right, and so you have a more difficult toddler than you would have had later. Or you have a 9-year-old or a 15-year-old with depression or anxiety. I, we don't, we, we, we can't take the brunt of blame for all of that. What I think what we're trying to point out on this show is that, if there are some early signs that there might be some emotional issue, perhaps learning how to work with that child well from the beginning might help to change the ultimate outcome. Um, And it's very, very important if there is a parent who is struggling or a primary caregiver who is struggling with mood or anxiety or just with taking care of the baby, how important it is to give support to those individuals, right? Right. Um, and another thing I'd like to point out, too, is that, you know, we, especially in our country, we don't really get a manual on how to, to work with babies or deal with babies or parent, right? A lot of us learn how to be a parent by recalling our own experiences. And so even if, for example, you're not having difficulty with anxiety or depression, acknowledging that how you were parented is probably how you're going to parent your own children right. unless you know, you've picked up some other tips and things along the way. Um, And so in infant mental health, we talk a lot about ghosts in the nursery. Um, Selma Freiberg um, really in the 70s coined that um, that term. So we have ghosts in the nursery and angels in the nursery. And the idea there is, is that 
there are, you know, particular experiences in our past, especially as we were being parented Mm -hmm. that kind of come up for us when we're parenting our own children. And sometimes they can be good and sometimes they can be not so good. Um, And so we call those ghosts or angels and just being aware of how that might be influencing um, to your interactions with your baby is sometimes helpful. I like that. Ghost and angels. I think Michelle had another question before we go to our first break. And we have open lines, listener. Jump into the conversation at one eight seven seven mpb ring That's 877-672-7464. Do you have some of those ghosts or angels in your past that you'd like to talk about or perhaps you have questions about? You can give us a call. Okay, Michelle, what was that question? Well, it's two questions. You yeah. mentioned um, some, a parent having a ch- second child and saying how challenging the second child is versus the first child. And again, it could be innate mm-hmm. uh, or birth order. Birth, birth order plays a big part, I believe, in uh, the situation of how a child reacts to their social environment. Uh, they're the second child. They're in, I hate to say it, but they're competing against this first child. Sometimes, <laughs> Sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes. It, depend, um, it yeah. depends. Yeah, there's mm-hmm. there's actual uh, actually a lot of study about birth order, right, Dr. Walker? Right. And, you know, even if you're not even taking a research perspective on it, you know, when you have, when it's one child, you may not be as stressed or sleep deprived as you will be when there's two children around. And so even who you are as a person, when that second child can come around, might look a little different. You might be a little bit more stressed out. And so all of those things play a role in infant behavior and, you know, temperament and all of those things, as well as the parent's own perception of how difficult it is, right? It could have been very similar to their first baby, but they just didn't have all of those stressors of an additional child when they had their first baby. And so it's all, you know, related. Right. Okay. I think we're going to go on to our first caller before we go to our break. We have Lafayette from New Albany. Hi, Lafayette. Yes, yes ma'am. Uh, you know, this may be a controversial issue, but whoever said you know, that the nuclear family it was the best, you know, for kids. Because, you know, as we, what happens if the parents just aren't good? And that happens a lot. Or what if the parents are good and they're they're trying and they're just not able? You know, that, that, that saying it takes a village, it, you know, it, it really, that is literally true. You know, if you, if you believe in, you know, science that people just like us, it, it, identical to us, you know, DNA wise, Homo sapiens lived thousands of years ago in hunter gatherer groups of, of maybe 100 to 200 in size. I guarantee you that those children were raised by that whole group mm-hmm. and they, they, they they made sure that all those children were treated fairly, that they all received, you know, the same benefit, you know, the same uh, education, you know, for whatever whatever that meant back then. But uh, anyway, that's just a comment. You know, I could even be more controversial by saying the nuclear family could be based on religion. You know, I don't know. But, you know, I really went out on a limb there, and I, <laughs> I, I, I'm going to. I'm going to, uh, and you know, I'm going to hang up and, and, and see if y'all would like to comment on that. Yeah, I certainly do. Um, I'll say a couple of words and then we come back. When we come back, I'll ask Dr. Walker about that. Lafayette brings up a really excellent point um, about nuclear family. And, and I'll throw something further out there. So what is the nuclear family? Because back many, many years ago, if you look at history, often families, there were grandparents and aunts and uncles and couples who got married and just moved on to the compound. And so um, the, the nuclear family was quite large, and there were many adults helping to support the growth of young children. And so, um, you know, with our mobile society now, many people don't even have a single relative around them. And so what the nuclear family has become, perhaps, is 
maybe a single mother or, uh, you know, two parents uh, with no other external support. So if you have one or two parents who are struggling, there's not that support. So I think you bring up a great point, and it's one that Dr. Walker brought up earlier about it takes a village. So Let's go to our next break, and when we come back, listeners, I'd love for you to weigh in on that. What what do you view as a nuclear family, and how important do you think it is that you're around relatives or have some extended friend support? Give us a call, 1-877-MPB-RING. That's 877-672-7464. You can send an email to family at mpbonline.org. This is Relatively Speaking, and we'll be right back. Hi, I'm Dr. Susan Buttress. Parents are a child's first teacher. Children make connections to the growing world around them through back and forth interactions. Parents and other caregivers can help children learn communication and social emotional skills by talking, reading, and singing each day. More information at MississippiThrive.com. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Welcome back and thanks for listening. This is Relatively Speaking. I'm Dr. Susan Buttress here with Dr. Courtney Walker, and we're talking about infant mental health, emotional health, relational health, and how we get to that. Um, Before our break, we had a caller who mentioned issues about the nuclear family and, and, and whether or not it's just the nuclear family. So we have several callers, and our first is Cheryl from Pearl. Hi, Cheryl. Hey, how you doing, Doc? Great. Thanks for calling. I'm truly honored to be on the phone with you because this is my second time catching your wonderful program. Oh, thank you so much. I'm glad you're listening and calling in, too. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. So I wanted to kind of chime in and and, uh, piggyback on the last caller's comments. I have to agree wholeheartedly, you know, that um, the the nuclear family, to me, it's a it's a failing, you know, right before right before our eyes. Mm. Things, I mean, things are out of balance so bad in America, and we are not. We are not um, noticing and, uh, rip, you know, providing remedy mm-hmm. uh, rapidly enough to make things better for the whole. A lot of times you'll find that individuals operate just like that as individuals. They have no sense of uh, the big picture, the community, um, and, and this trickles down very heavily upon the children and like I said, I thank you so much for your program. Uh, having dialogue about this might not be the most uh, interesting thing in the world to talk about, but I guarantee you this conversation needs to be had, and we need to really take the bull by the horns and take our selfishness and throw it mm. in the ash can of history because it's not doing us any favors. Cheryl, you brought some great points up. Let me um tell you about a sign that one of my neighbors has in her yard and I love it. It says make America kind again. And I think you you just hit the nail on the head that that so much of our our thought and our it seems goal is is self serving and not not out for the good of the whole. And if we could do that, that would be great. Um, so I think that that was a really good point that you brought up, and I think we need to remember. I also think that learning to take responsibility in the home when you're young um, 
is important. Learning how to do chores, learning how you can contribute, very, very important. And early on, that can be great. So Cheryl, thank you for that. Um, Great, great thoughts. Um, I want to stay on the phones. Uh, Let's go next to Michael from Picayune. Hi, Michael. Thanks for calling. Hi, how you doing? Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Thank you. What are your thoughts? Oh, I just want to make a couple of comments on what some of the people said before it really does take a village and i just want to say as a i've I've been a priest since age 19 and i just want to say to america please give yourself permission to be happy you know that's that's good um yeah i think so many times you know michelle was asking me during the break what do you think has changed why why do you think we've gotten worse what's happening and and i think some of it is that um we're always reaching for something we don't have maybe maybe we are thinking too hard that somebody's grass is greener than ours and are not centering and just being there being present and and being happy is that where you're going with this oh uh i'm not really going anywhere i understand i've i've, I've given college lectures for so many years and met so many people i just love people of serving people and i have no agenda uh but we do i, I follow the ancient Vedas, which most people don't know about. It goes back millions of years to the beginning of creation, but that's controversial. But I just want to say that we focus on the simple things, simple living and high thinking, and we really are related. We're all family in the spiritual world. We're all family, and there's one Father. So we don't need to divide ourselves by skin color or by um, religions or anything like that. We're all family. It takes a family. It takes a village. And, you know, the village way of life has gone on since time and memorial. And what do you think they're doing in the spiritual world? They're living the village way of life. That mm-hmm. is the – how could you get any better than that? You know? yeah. It's just that we, when you put God in the center of your life, then that's true happiness. Thank you. Thank you. Good thoughts. Good thoughts. I I completely agree that we really all need to think of ourselves as one and quit trying to figure out how to divide and prove differences. Thank you for that. Um, All right. We've got uh, a couple more callers to go to. Let's go to Don from Olive Branch. Hi, Don. Hello. uh, I'd have to say I agree with uh, some of the callers you had at the nuclear Family is, I think, is the best way to go. I think we, over time, we have uh, alluded uh, to put the responsibility on the government, the federal government, whatever, to see after our children, and and we don't hold our children as part of the family as close. You know, I think in the past, the whole family was responsible for survival. And the children had to contribute. And I think in the last several years, maybe we've become more fluent or whatever. And uh, we don't we don't ask the children to uh, to contribute to the family. It's not their responsibility. And, and so they grow up that way. And they're expecting somebody else. They're expecting the government or somebody to take care of them. And so... I'm thinking, you know, the family is the most uh, important. And I've read statistics, you know, where uh, in the 30s and 40s, the black family was even more uh, a nucleus than in in the white neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think that President Johnson, when he did this program in the 60s, uh, was supposed to help people. I think he, at that time, he put to be on the government and everybody started looking to the government to to take care of them yeah and, and you can see the results you know it's been 60 years since uh 50 or 60 years since that happened and i don't know if anybody's happy with the results that's going on right now well don um thank you for your thoughts and and i will just say that there's a lot of controversy about that and whether the welfare system was set up correctly or not and what it has done um or has not done and we know that there's still great disparity 
and that that some changes clearly need to be made. But I think that's a, another whole topic. Um, that, but I, I think your comments back to the nuclear family, and I, I will just say this: I want to get to the next two callers and back to Dr. Walker in a minute. But I will say with the nuclear family, I think everybody is agreeing that if we have a nuclear family that's really truly a family with support, that is the best thing you can do and teach children that they truly are contributing part of that nuclear family. All right. Well, let's go next to, we have Sharon from Meridian. Hi, Sharon. Hi, how are you today? Doing great. Thank you for calling. I just wanted to ask you, um, I do dog rescue and we end up in a lot of situations where we, the greater the poverty, the greater the abuse, and we see so many children and elderly people that are being neglected. And a lot of times I really think it's out of ignorance. And I wanted to know all the young people that I'm dealing with, they're on their phones all the time. Are there anywhere, any places or online that I could, about parenting skills and the importance of the development of your child that I could let these young people know about that maybe they that they're not going to go to any place but they might go online yeah. and learn how to take better care of their children you know Sharon first of all I just want to comment real quickly before I turn this over to Dr. Walker because the answer is yes and I know she can give you some of that but this is what we're talking about when we say it takes a village Sharon is not a parent of these kids but she is somebody who's going into the community and trying to help so thank you for that Sharon Dr. Walker, do you have some resources that you'd like to give out to Sharon? Yeah, sure. And um, before I, I'm going to rattle off some um, websites that might be helpful, but I also want to just kind of highlight that going back to our discussion about ghosts and angels in the nursery, a lot of times that we see um, trauma, neglect, a lot of it is um, unintentional. I don't mean to do this, but I haven't seen a different way. I haven't uh, been treated a different way from my own parents. And so a lot of that we're going to, is what we're trying to unlearn what was done to us, which is really, really hard. And so whenever I, you know, um, I encounter something like that, I take a step back and I try to remember Right. Um, I can't imagine what this person's childhood must have been like, and it might have been very, very difficult. And so that helps me provide uh, or helps me have a, I don't know, a different perspective on some things. Um, but I really like going to resources that could be helpful. So we, of course, we have our Mississippi Thrive.com website that has tons of resources and tons of links that parents can access. And another group that I, I really like and that just has some really basic, easy to understand parenting um, strategies is zero to three. So zero is spelled out, zero to three dot org. Okay. And they have tons of information, free, accessible for parents um, that can be helpful. Um, so I, I usually recommend those two and start from there. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. I'm going to write them down, check them out, and pass it along. Thank you all. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, and we'll put that on the podcast too, Sharon. Thank you for bringing that right. up. Um, and thanks so much for working with animals in the way that you do. That is such a noble thing to do and I know little money in it if any um, it often is just voluntary so thank you for that we really thank appreciate it thank you so much <laughs> so um, Dr. Walker in the last couple of minutes I'd, I'd like for us to talk a little bit about things that might might be risk factors for poor infant mental health. I know we've touched on it. And then things that perhaps a parent can do. I wanted to give you a couple of minutes to to talk about that. Um, and then where where could they reach out for help if they really do want a mental health expert? Sure. Um, so there's a lot of things that can place us at risk. Um, you know, we talked about ghosts in our nursery, um, maybe potentially traumatic experiences when we were kids. Um, and, you know, we might have 
experienced something that wasn't so good from our parents. So that's a risk factor right there. Other things kind of closer to um, having a baby. So um, sometimes parents, moms in particular, um, they might have a traumatic birth experience or their pregnancy may not have gone exactly how they planned it. They may have had losses before that baby. So all of those things can place a parent at risk for just some difficulty adjusting to a new baby, especially if it's their first baby. Um, so sometimes moms, um, dads too, but moms will um, kind of report, my baby's here and I, I don't feel attached to my baby. Like what's wrong with me? Something must be wrong. But actually that's relatively normal. And especially if you had some of those things that I was mentioning a complicated pregnancy, a traumatic birth experience, all those things can impact how you attach with your baby. And postpartum and pregnancy in general messes up things and, you know, um, can place you at risk for postpartum depression and anxiety. So those things are, are usually some of the major things that I look out for. Um, and if you are a parent who's struggling with that or a caregiver who's struggling with that, um, specifically related to uh, caregiver mental health. I really like Postpartum Support International, um, short PSI, but they have um, support groups that are free and accessible to anybody who registers for them. And it really is a non-judgmental place where a new parent, um, a new caregiver can come and just vent and talk about things that are might, that might be going on in their lives and then get support from people who are going through it at the same time. So I, I really like that resource um, because I think it goes back to, you know, it takes a village. It takes a village to raise a child, but it also takes a village to support a family. Um, and so I always want to kind of go back to, yes, we're talking about children, we're talking about infants, but these kids live in the context of their family. However, their family chooses to define that structure, it's up to them. But we have to support families in order to have healthy babies and healthy children. So um, um, I could just leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> great, great information. And we will put um, that also that support group on the podcast. So I think, thank you so much as always, Dr. Walker, for being with us. I think that um, we had some great calls who pointed out how important this topic really is. And, and I think somebody, I can't remember who said it, maybe Cheryl, our caller Cheryl said, maybe people don't think this is terribly exciting and gut wrenching stuff, but it really is because I'm going to say it. I say it all the time. Babies are our future. Children are our future. We have got to do a good job taking care of our children. So Thanks for that. Thanks for being with us. Thanks, listeners. And if you'd like to hear this show again or any past episodes, you can listen to the podcast on your favorite podcast app by searching Southern Remedy, Relatively Speaking. This show is a production of MPB Think Radio and engineered by Michelle McAdoo. I'm Dr. Susan Buttress, and I hope you'll join us next Tuesday at 11 for Relatively Speaking and that you'll stay tuned for NPR's Here and Now, coming up next on MPB Think Radio.